Okay, good morning, everybody. We, um, someone's just asked whether we're gonna record this session. Um, and so by saying we are gonna record it, uh, I'm just um, making sure we are recording. Um, hello, everyone. Um, we uh, will have more people join, I'm sure, but uh, we've only got an hour for this webinar and I know we're gonna need all the time. So we're gonna get started. Welcome to what I'm sure will be a very exciting webinar uh, on a critically important issue for the investment and saving industry, indeed wider than investment and saving industry, looking at how men can be more effective allies to women. I'm John Terry. I'm a member of the Diversity Projects Advisory Board and our CEO Agenda Subgroup. I'm delighted to be the moderator of this session on a topic that is really close to my heart. You will notice that I'm looking pretty relaxed today in my purple jumper. This is deliberate and it is one of the International Women's Day's colors and purple uh, signifies justice and dignity. It was either me wearing a jumper or my purple suit. So hopefully I've chosen the right version. When you see the rest of our panelists, you will see that they've also very much adopted the colors of International Women's Day, which are green, white, and purple. And I'd like to have a shout out and thank you to Moira Joseph, a student at Leeds University who had the privilege of mentoring as part of the Diversity Project Upreach uh, Mentoring Program. She posted a great article on LinkedIn earlier this week on the history of IWD and I was reminded of the colors and the significance of those, so thank you. Over the last few years, many investment and savings industry firms have put gender equality at the center of their efforts to create more diverse workplaces and inclusive workplaces as well. However, there is no doubt that there is an awful long way to go before we can genuinely say that the industry has a level playing field for women. This is borne out, for example, by the fact that less than 10% of monies are managed by women, over three quarters of senior leaders in the industry are men, and the gender pay gap is one of the worst in the UK. So it's a sad fact that men dominate leadership and decision-making roles across the industry. I was reminded earlier this week that International Women's Day was recognized by the UN in 1976 that's over 40 years ago, and we've still got an awful long way to go. Is it really possible to drive toward gender equality without men playing a full and active role? And how can men be more effective in, sport, in supporting gender equality agenda? Well, we're gonna be discussing this, and I'm delighted to be joined by four brilliant panelists, quickly introducing each of them. First of all, Kathleen Hughes, who is the Global Head of Liquid Solutions at Goldman Sachs. Catherine is also a member of Diversity Projects Advisory Council's GEO CEO Gender Subgroup. Secondly, we have Mitesh Seth, who's the CEO of Reddington, is a passionate member of everything, but in particular, the gender equality agenda and as part of the Diversity Projects Advisory Council. We have Syrai Jacob Whelan, is internal counsel at Macquarie. She co-chairs the Diversity Project's Careers Path work stream, ensuring that women have a level playing field in order to progress through the organization is absolutely critical part of gender equality. So she has a brilliant and really important critical role. And last but certainly not least, Mark Freed, who's the CEO of E2W. Mark is a highly vocal supporter of equality and in particular gender equality. Before we get started, a quick reminder, please do use the chat function to raise any points you want or any questions. If you use the chat function rather than the q and i I'll be monitoring it through the next hour and I'll be ensuring that we address those questions and bring them into the discussion. We do our best to address them all and we do our best in the hour to ensure that we, we look at the whole range of issues. And they would include why men are important in creating gender equality, what the barriers are for more men to become effective allies to women, what does an effective ally look like? And critically, we really want to provide some practical tips of how men can be better male allies. So let's get started. So let's look at that first question. Why are male allies are really important to create a greater gender equality? Kathleen, I'm gonna start with you. Um, and as you get yourself ready here, I thought it'd be useful to just share with everyone a definition of a male ally that I like, which is a man who actively supports gender equality meaning they believe all genders should be able to access the same opportunities and resources with the same level of ease. 
And critically important, ally in this context is a verb. It requires action. It is not passive. Kathleen, you are a highly successful senior leader in a major international high profile firm. I'm assuming that in a firm that going back 20 years ago was even more dominated by men than it is now, that you have had the support of some men along your career journey. It'd be great to hear some of your personal experiences, if you could, sharing um, with, the, with the audience about, about those. Sure, happy to. Thank you, John. I mean, I think it's been said, and I certainly agree with the statement that women can be over-mentored and under-sponsored, right? So we're given lots of advice, um, but it's more rare when a, a male ally, a male colleague, or, or male um, uh, you know, peer will step up and actually put his political capital on the line to help advance the, the career of a woman. And um, it does happen and it happens occasionally and hopefully it's happening more frequently now, but I think um, that happened to me earlier in my career. So I'm happy to, to share that story. I was actually going for a bigger role within, uh, within the organization and um, my boss called, and he was also the hiring manager for this role, called and told me that, you know, thank you for putting yourself forward and, you know, uh, sharing your thoughts on the role, but we're going to, I'm going to go with the other candidate. And I was disappointed and I said, okay, but I agreed. Um, and then I got another call. I didn't see an announcement go out. I got a call from another senior leader, a man um, in the organization who I knew, but not incredibly well. And he said, Kathleen, did you want that job? And I said, yeah, I did. I, I, I posted for it, but my boss has made a decision to go with the other person. And he said something funny like, well, maybe, maybe that's not final or what, what have you. And a day later, my boss called me back and said that he had decided to uh, go, for, go with me for the job. He changed his mind. And I, you know, quickly realized that I didn't, unbeknownst to me, that I had this sponsor out there who was willing to put his, you know, political capital on the line and, and get his, you know, his peer to actually change the hiring decision and go with me instead and give me a shot. And when I look back, that was a very, I would say, critical time and, and turning point in my career and kind of put me on the track to, to where I am today. So eternally grateful to that sponsor I didn't know I had. And I think that's a true definition of a, of a male ally. Well, I think that's a, that's a brilliant story. And I'd like to think there are thousands and tens of thousands of those stories around the industry, but we certainly need to make sure they become more and more of those. A great start, great story. Thank you. Sarai, you um, are obviously in, in a slightly uh, earlier stage in your career than Kathleen. Uh, that's not a reflection of Kathleen's age, of course. Um, and so you may have had some slightly different experiences. So I'd be interested to hear you know, some of your experience around um, met your, you know, we've experienced positively men being uh, allies to you. I also know that you feel quite strongly that um, male allies should not only be senior leaders, um, um, that all men uh, should really be involved in this. So if you could touch on that, I'd be, that would be really great as well. Yeah, th thanks, John. So I, I've been really lucky to have had amazing allies, whether it comes to sponsors or mentors or, or managers both male and female, and actually to, to your point, that's the first point I'd like to touch on. I think male allyship is incredibly important at the moment where leadership is dominated by senior males, as, as you've mentioned. But I think we need to think about the concept a little bit more broadly. This is about junior men, this is about women, this is about all of us working together, and we need to start thinking about the concept of allyship a little bit more broadly. And I also really like the point that you made about um, allyship being active, I think the way I like to think about allyship is that it's taking a genuine interest in someone's development and career. Um, but back to your question on my personal experiences, for me, allyship has been, um, has manifested itself as someone taking a genuine interest in, in my career. Um, and I can think of two examples, and both of them have been very much around understanding the rules of the institution when you're coming into a new environment. The first time was when I moved to work in Sao Paulo, a place I'd never been to, and I'm ashamed to say didn't speak the language when I arrived and agreed to take the post. Um, but I had a fantastic mentor who um, you know, really showed me the ropes and, and helped me to get language classes, which was kind of really instrumental in, in my successful time there. Um, the second was when I was joining Macquarie, I was transitioning from a law firm into a business team. And I had a fantastic manager who really um, took me under his wing, showed me, um, shared knowledge with me around the unwritten rules 
particularly on how to get things done where your energy is well spent. Um, I think this is, these are kind of points that, that men intuitively and actively share with their more junior male colleagues or men who are new to the environment. But I think it's less obvious to take a new female recruit under your wing and understand that she, she understands these, these rules. That's great. I think all those stories are great. In fact, already um, your point about everyone being an ally and looking at allyship broadly, much more broadly, is really important. And someone's already posted in, in chat that um, we shouldn't forget about uh, senior women um, who are actually helping men in their careers. And I should say that my first three bosses in my 30 odd career in consulting were all women. Um, and I learned, frankly, more from those women and was supported more by them than my subsequent male colleagues. I hope none of my subsequent male colleagues are listening to me say that, but that is that is true. Um, I think is really important. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Mitesh, um, it would be really interesting to hear your views of why you are an ally. I'm, I'm assuming you're an ally, as you said, wouldn't be on, on this webinar, but that'd be really interesting if you could share your personal views about why, have you, why are you an ally? Thanks, John. I definitely didn't wake up one day and say, today I'm going to become an ally. Um, if I'm honest, I didn't, I'd not heard of the word in this context until someone told me that I was an ally and then I Googled it. So uh, that was my, my beginning and journey. And I think if I look more deeply though, I was raised with a view that we have to look at the privileges we have and we have a responsibility to build bridges for those who don't have the same privileges. And I think when you spend even a second thinking about the privileges we benefit from as simply by being a man, you have to do something back to your point around this being a verb and an action. Um, I can relate a little bit because I've spent a lot of my career not belonging or being the minority in the room. And I had great allies and sponsors when I look back on my career. Um, so I think, especially when men are in a position of power, we have a responsibility to change the system. And I'm sad to say, if we're not doing something about changing it, we are part of the problem. So I don't think it's a choice. Well, I, I, th I, think, I think that last point just made that it's not a choice. Um, and we need, dare I say, more men to uh, recognize that that's the case. And if they are not being active, they are part of the problem. And I can see Mark nodding ferociously because I know he, he strongly you know, agrees with that. And I know that you also take the view that this is not, Mark, about just men supporting, dare I say, weak women or less talented women. You know, and, and it'd be really interesting to hear your views around that um, and a bit more about positive action, if, if, uh, if you may. And it's the first time I need to say, Mark, you need to take yourself off of mute. Thank you. There we are. A, 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 pound in the, a pound in the box. Sorry, I apologise. Um, so, some great stories there already. Um, I, I, yeah, I do. I, I have a, a, a problem with the, the term male ally. Um, it, it's so often got a connotation of this sort of strong man supporting weak woman. Um, and yeah, I recognise that we need to level the playing field. Um, but to get real sustained and fully committed action, you know, I think we need to get men involved because they see what's in it for them as well. Um, we, we, we shouldn't be doing it. Us men shouldn't be doing it because it's the right thing to do or, or only because it's the right thing to do or only because we've got daughters or to wear some kind of badge of honour or because we're measured, rewarded and targeted to do it. Um, if we're going to get more men involved, and we need to, and we have to, we need to show them what's in it for them. And more choice, more opportunity, better workplaces, better society, better marriages, better families, and so much more is what's in it for them. Um, and if we start selling that, we're going to get more men involved. Um, but John, the, the second part of your question was, Let's talk action. Um, um, le leaders in the investment and saving industry are unanimous. Um, you know, diversity and inclusion is a business imperative. However, you know, as you've already said, and we've seen through gender pay gap reporting, um, you know, we're not making great progress. Um, you know, we're, we're where we were four years ago. Um, pay and bonus gaps have not significantly narrowed. 
Um, you know, action is not saying the right things, signing up to charters, joining industry-wide projects, and then just tinkering. You know, action is driving bold change, doing, doing the hard things, changing the way you act and lead, and ensuring that your initiatives um, are implemented on the ground in the way you intended and are having the effect that you intended. Um, so yeah, you know, we need real commitment um, and we need action from our industry leaders um, as well as those men around us. Um, Thanks, Mark. I mean, if I can just follow on from that with you, Mark. I mean, I think, you know, we're all passionately agree that we need men more involved um, and be much more effective and more of them. Um, um, but there's clearly a number of things that are happening here that are preventing or getting in the way of, of, of both more men getting involved in supporting gender equality, both at the macro and the micro level, and we're going to come back to that a bit later, um, but also being more effective. Um, and I know that, um, I mean, you're a man of research, Mark, and you like looking at the research. Um, and it'd be interesting if I could start with you when we start looking at the issues of what's getting in the way, what are the barriers? And if you can, uh, if you can just share some of that research with us uh, to get that kicked off, that'd be great. Thank, thank you, John. Um, I, I, we, we've, we've this this week, I've been involved in launching a, a, a new initiative called Men for Inclusion, um, and um, one of my colleagues on that is a is a fantastic lady, Jill Armstrong, um, who led the collaborating with men action research program at um, Murray Edwards College at Cambridge. Um, and to sum up, um, uh, Jill found in her research that there were, were three basic reasons why men don't get involved. Um, and, and the first one is relevance. Um, I think Mitesh touched on some of this, um, but quite often if, you, if you're in this um, privilege, if you've got this privilege, um, you're more likely to see a problem with representation than inclusion. Um, you know, how often have we heard men say, you know, I, I've got a, I, I, I'm in this, you know, I recruited two women um, into my team. And the fact is, if they don't feel that they belong, then we're not getting there, we're not doing the right things. Um, and quite often men don't see or understand the lived experiences of their, their colleagues, and they don't see their privilege. They don't think it's their problem. The second thing that Jill highlighted was, was motivation. And I've already touched a bit on this. It's what's in it for me? Um, the male allies, he for she is strong man helping weak woman. Um, and that's not a good sales strategy to gain sustained committed support. Um, and when men are supportive, um, they often don't know what they can do and what they need to do differently and how they can help. Um, so we need to do some work there. Um, the third thing that, that Jill um, saw and found in her research was a fear of saying the wrong thing. Um, I don't want to put my foot in it. Um, I always say the wrong thing. Um, and even worse, some men expressed a fear that standing up and standing out might actually damage their, their career progression. Um, so you know, to overcome some of these barriers, um, you know, Jill and, and the team at Men for Inclusion have defined programs that help men and women come together, share experiences, knowledge and understanding um, to support in uh, delivering change in a, in a new culture. Thanks, Mark. And we're going to come back to um, looking at what are the practical things men can do more, and indeed what women can do to, to help enable men. Um, but Tesh, if I, if I may just come to you on this, um, what is your view about what's stopping men becoming more successful? Is anything that Mark said there resonate with you as well? Yeah, it really does. Um, I, I, I definitely think there's a natural fear of getting it wrong. So I think that I think the, 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 the why we need to do this is reasonably well understood. As you said, it's been a long time we've been talking about this and making commitments. But where I don't see enough action is around the what do I specifically do? And what if I get it wrong? What if I make a fool of myself? What if I worse, you know, get 
you know, uh, uh, get criticized for it. And I think that fear of making mistakes, saying the wrong thing, good intentions being misinterpreted are, re are real issues that I see again and again and that I've experienced. Um, and I think there's a, a real need to be able to get past your own ego, right? So much of the world we're in, especially in our, our industry, is where we're experts and where we're treading on known ground and where we're, where, where we're right. And here's a subject where we've got to accept that we don't know, we haven't, as Mark said earlier, got the lived experiences of the women that work with us. And we, we're gonna to have to unlearn and relearn. And that's scary. Uh, and it does come back down to risk appetite and willingness to take risks and get it wrong and learn. And I know when I've been challenged or criticized by the women I work with, it's been a real blow to my ego. And I've had to pick myself back up, dust myself back up and carry on because there's no choice. As I said earlier, you don't get to go away and sulk. And so I tried. <laughs> So, but that's the that's the nature by which we get we we do this. I think. Um, I really like I that. The men like have to. Make a quick point Please. on that, because um, I know you and I we've talked about microaggressions in the past, and um, and I just would like to kind of to pick up on Natasha's point because I think it's it's a brilliant one. You know that there is this fear of, of getting getting it wrong, and I think um, I just like to kind of de-escalate or kind of take the temperature down when we think about microaggressions. I think. We all need to become a bit more comfortable kind of calling them out and also being called out for them. I think if we can take the temperature down and look at them as an opportunity to learn about what makes people comfortable or not, we're going to be able to kind of make, make a lot more progress. So I really agree with what Mitesh was saying. And it's about normalising, isn't it? It's about exactly. normalising being challenged, normalising about, as, as Mitesh said, I like the expression, you know, we need to unlearn and relearn. Yeah. Um, uh, and you know that is 99% of that I suspect is men need to do the unlearning and relearning but this also, willingness also I think on, on women's part like calling it out it's not a big deal like it's I think that there's learning to be done on both sides yeah I, I mean I agree with that I mean you and I've talked about this particular point before I think you know uh, calling out actually should be celebrated and I think you know men really should be celebrating the fact when they are called out even though as Matesh said you know, their ego's just taken a great big bash. Um, and, and they need to celebrate that publicly. So in, it both supports the person that's called them out, whether that's a man or a woman, um, um, and indeed it encourages more so from, from other people to do so. And then it becomes normalized. And I think this normalization is, is really important. Uh, Kathleen, can I just bring you in here? Um, there, there, there is some stuff here that's out there, which is, you know, that, that the fact that, well, actually there's, there's more that women can do to help men, which is, I feel bad saying that. Right. I really do feel bad just saying that. But I mean, um, do you believe that's the case? Is there some more stuff that women can do? And if so, you know, what, 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 they, what they may well be to bring their, help bring those barriers down? Yeah, no, I think that, that women can do, um, you know, different things to, to work on that. What, you know, some practical advice that I would, I would point to. There have been times in my career when I've gotten um, feedback that's been incredibly rosy. And while that makes you feel good in the moment, it doesn't give you an opportunity to grow or to improve. Um, so I think women should be, you know, not shy in asking for really critical feedback. You know, if you want to grow, if you want to, if you want to, uh, your career to expand, or you want more responsibility, and you want to improve, or you want to operate at the top of your game, you need to, you know, maybe proactively ask for that feedback and and make sure you're saying you want it to be constructive and critical, but you also have to be open to it. Um, and be in the in the mindset to receive that. I think some male managers, I mean, I've seen this myself, um, have you know may hold back from giving critical feedback uh, to women. Um, so women shouldn't be afraid of asking for it and making it a very open discussion and saying, "I want to learn. I want to grow. Can you please tell me? Yes, my review you said I'm doing great, but there's got to be two or three things that I really need to, you know, you'd like to see me improve on in order to continue to grow and uh, and progress." So that would be one small bit of advice. Thank you. I'm just going to pick up one of the questions here. And if I may, I'm, I'm going to put this to Matesh. Um, um, it's one of these points around, you know, is there a threat that, um, you know, to men from helping women progress? So in other words, is it a zero sum game? Um, and, and now have you heard that amongst some of your own colleagues in, in Reddington and beyond? And if so, what, what's your answer to that? Yeah, I, I don't think I have seen it being seen as a zero sum game. Um, 
I think that there's a that, that for, for all of us, the risk of change and any kind of change is the risk of loss. And often that's not a conscious, deliberate, even awareness of it. But if there's a fear somewhere that you're going to lose something, whether that is losing face, whether that is losing political capital or, or something else, I think that will get in the way of us doing something. It, it reduces the ease by which we will make change. Um, but no, I haven't. I haven't heard that specifically referred to. No, I, I, I think that's that, that's great. I just want to share something from my PwC days about this particular point because the the question was very specific. I mean, around you know, is there a threat of helping women progress? Um, uh, PwC didn't make a distinction between helping anyone to progress, but they they assess partners. Um, on a whole bunch of things, one of which is collaboration, by the way, but another one which is very linked here is how they actually pull up the people around them. And they're very specifically assessed on that. And I think that's uh, something worth thinking about as, 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 as leaders who may be on the call around how can they actually make some practical difference around, around assessments. Um, we've got the timing about right, because I now want to move on to much more practical things as well, although I'm brilliant, we've actually peppered the discussion so far with that. And we're gonna move on to what makes a really effective man ally. And I just wanted to share with you a personal experience. Um, I've had mentors, I've been lucky enough to have mentors um, most of my career. And one of my wise mentors, uh, who you won't be surprised to know uh, is a woman, once said to me uh, many years ago that to be a truly effective ally, the first thing I needed to do was to recognize it wasn't about me. Um, and that's really to Matesh's point about ego. Um, and when she said that out loud, it really struck home. And then it was easier for me to recognize the other things that she really drilled into me is that the first and foremost is that I need to listen to women's voices and to really demonstrate at all times respect and to get myself comfortable in educating myself about what are the issues. And that's a really around the unlearn and relearn that Mitesh was referencing before. And in practical terms, it included me eliminating my own sexism I'm recognizing that that is the case, that you know, there are actions that I carry out that are based in sexism and eliminating those. Um, and to be informed, to be both a, 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 an ally on the ground, but also a public ally. And I, I want to come back to that point around public ally as well. I try to live to those principles. I fall down um, and, and I, I encourage everybody around me and everyone on, on this webinar, to pull me up whenever I do that, because it's part of the learning and part of the growing, which I think is really, really, really important. So I'm really interested in May, I'm gonna start with uh, uh, Sarai and, and Kathleen on whether any of what I've just said, or indeed wider issues you know, resonate with you uh, uh, about personally, but really about what are you personally looking for, for in an effective man who's an ally to you and to women more generally? Um, uh, so I can. Yeah, so I, you know, John, I think these these principles really resonated with me when you mentioned them. I I really like the point about recognizing that you know it isn't about you as an individual, um, and I think that also applies to women. And to Kathleen's point about kind of asking for that hard feedback, I'd really encourage women to be brave in when they see opportunities for men to be allies, to be brave in taking those opportunities and, and think about the bigger picture. Um, but to go back to the point around um, what, what am I looking for in an effective male ally, I think there are three key things that I'd like to call out. The first is don't, don't make assumptions. Don't make assumptions about what the women in your team want or need. If you don't know where to start, ask a question, have a conversation. Um, you'll probably from there be able to identify the action together. I think it's about working together. Um, share information freely would be my second point. Um, by definition, you're going to have a different perspective, especially if you are a senior male. Um, and, and that's the beauty of diversity of thought. Um, but to really benefit from that, that, those different perspectives, we need to share them, to leverage them. Um, so, you know, perhaps you work in a different business or a different area, you can see an opportunity for a particular woman to add value or um, bring across some expertise facilitate that collaboration actively. Um, and the third one, John, is one I know you, you also feel strongly about, it's, it's be public, be public about your allyship. Um, and I think there's a couple of limbs to that. Firstly, it's about talking about what you are doing, you know, how you're supporting women, um, 
where did you find the opportunities? Get practical with um, with the kind of organisations that you might be working with, or um, you know how you went about approaching kind of being an active ally. Um, and have and I think if you're kind of practical about it, it will infuse the culture of the team and the organisation. And I think the second limb about being public is about supporting policies that are good for everyone. Flexible working arrangement, paid parental leave. Um, these are things that we don't often see men talking very vocally about. And, and I think they're even more critical as a result of the, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Oh, great, great points there. Thank, thank you. Uh, Kathleen, um, is there anything you, you would like to add in relation to what you're looking for to, for, for an effective ally? Yeah, and I, I really agree with um, Sarai's three points. I also jotted down three, and one of them was exactly the same, um, but I'll, uh, I'll mention them. I think it starts with empathy, and we touched on this already. Matesh and Mark talked about it. It's really trying to understand the woman's perspective. You know, every man has women in their life, right? So they've got, you know, daughters, mothers, sisters, partners, friends, you know. I would say use those women as a sounding board, you know, get their thoughts. Really try to understand, you know, a woman's perspective. So that would be number one, starting with empathy. Uh, I also had, please don't make assumptions, you know, don't assume that a woman's not up for a mobility assignment or a role with travel just because she's a woman or is a mother or could become a mother. So I think, you know, no assumptions. And then the third, which I think is maybe one of the hardest uh, for my male friends, is allow women to have the full range of emotions that men have. Because we all have the same emotions, but sometimes women may express them differently. So we may express frustration or anger differently than, than a man might. So I would say allowing a woman to, to express that same full range of emotions without labeling her as hysterical or angry or whatever it might be, um, would be, you know, the third thing I would I would point to. And I think that's what true empathy can bring when you really have a, a full understanding of a woman's perspective, and you can allow her to have that range of emotions. That's, you know, being completely empathetic. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn to you. I'm, I'm interested in hearing what's on your personal to do list to be more <laughs> effective male ally. Do you mind? Do you mind addressing that? Thank, th thank you, John. Uh, uh, yeah, I've got, I've got, I've got, I think four, four things on my personal action list. Um, and the first one um, is to continue to understand and address my own biases and how my behaviour affects others around us. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I, I've been a passionate supporter of gender diversity for over twenty years with um, with E2W. Um, um, but I still make mistakes. I still get things wrong. Um, uh, I still say the wrong things. Um, and um, you know, I, we 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 all need to continue to learn and understand. Uh, so that, that that's action point one. Um, um, action point two. You know, we need to get more men that, frankly, you know, look like me involved in this. Um, and um, you know, um, we're not going to move and accelerate towards this finishing line um, unless we do. Um, so, um, you know, encouraging, um, helping, helping them understand why it is so important um, is my next personal action plan to, to commit time to do that. Um, and then, you know, to support the, the members of the community out there, uh, female members of the community, to help them flourish and progress um, through the work that we, we do with um, E2W, but also to, 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 to stand up for what's, what's good um, and point out what's good out there and the, the progress that's being made, um, as well as what's poor um, wherever I see it. Um, so th those are my four points, John. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mitesh. Um, you you speak uh, um, you know um, very openly um, and share uh, openly um, around what you're doing at Reddington, and I'm particularly interested in um, you sharing out how your sponsorship and engagement with, with women at Reddington has helped you personally become a more effective ally. Uh, thanks, John. Yeah, and and I think it really builds on the the, the, the point I made earlier, which is it's the only way to learn. Um, and, and I think to both what Kathleen and Sarai said, 
we can't go into this assuming we know um, and or can empathize. And I've, I've learned so much by asking questions of the women I work with and trying to create a safe space where they can challenge me. Some examples would be being challenged by women in the firm around the criteria that we use to promote MDs and recognizing inherent bias within that. And unless, until I was told that, I hadn't recognized it. Once I knew it, we could change it. Um, the other one was, you know, soon after we'd reduced our gender pay gap so dramatically, um, you know, I was called out by the women's network to say, don't for a minute think you're done. Here's 20 other things that we need to do. And again, it was a real blow to my ego for a moment. But then I rec it, it was it was an education in recognizing here are all the other issues that still need to be addressed and will continue to be. And again, because we heard them, we could understand them and we could make efforts to try and change them. More recently, um, I was I was I was I was, try I was concerned around the impact on women from COVID-19 and a fear that many firms will think, hey, but because we're all now working remotely, it's all going to be fine. It's going to be great. It's going to be positive for women in the workplace. And I didn't feel that way. But actually, when I engaged with the people at, at my at my firm, um, and, and I got a real kind of upswell of feedback from the women in the firm to say, Matesh, don't equate flexible working with gender. Um, and actually, if anything, what we need you and other leaders to do is to normalize and encourage and put a spotlight on men that use flexible working, because without that, we're not gonna get the gender equality we need. Um, those are just some examples, but these are all critical milestones in my development and our firm's development that you can't do by sitting in a box in an ivory tower. You only achieve through dialogue and by willing to be challenged. Um, so those are some examples. Thank you. And be prepared for me to put a challenge that one of the questions one of the, um, the audience has asked. Um, they'd, they'd like to understand um, a little bit more if you're happy to share around what were some of those barriers that you felt you had to remove um, and redefine um, the assessment criteria as uh, for, for MD that was being biased against women? Uh, there was a few, but there was one really specific one in the, in the interest of time that I'll share, which was around wanting to promote people who are directors into MD, who put their hand up for things, who pushed themselves forward, who, who spoke up. Um, and it was seen from a very entrepreneurial you know, proactive, you know, ownership of the firm mindset and completely missed the gender bias that sat deeply within it. So we removed it. Um, thank you. Thank you. And Kathleen, I'm going to, I'm going to start with you with, a, with a, a, another question, if, if I may, which is around, you, you were saying about you need to remove labels, um, you know, which is, which is a critical one. Um, uh, but uh, the experience of uh, the questioner is that men are really bad at coping with women who show their emotions, particularly when they tear up, um, which is which is a natural aspect of that. And they're really poor at doing that. Um, and it uh, men tend to see that as women are angry or frustrated, which is not necessarily the case. Um, any tips for for men, but also for, for women as well, I suppose, in relation to how can we remove that label about crying weak women who, you know, how we move away from that. Yeah, I think it's a couple of things. I think if men just understand that that is very natural for how women may express frustration, um, that, you know, tears may come and that's okay, right? And it's that normalization. For women, um, a very smart woman I know once told me that it was physically impossible to whistle and cry at the same time. So I've seen people try that technique. Um, but on the serious side, you know, men should be, you know, it's uncomfortable, but they, they need to get a little comfortable with being uncomfortable in that moment and just realize that it's just showing the same emotion that a male would, sh would show, but in a different, in a different way. Um, would be my my thoughts on that. Well, I, I think you know your expression there, but you know men have just got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. That's been resonating through a, you know, a, a number of aspects. Um, um, and please carry on keeping your questions going, uh, coming rather. And there's one or two that I'm going to bring into the next section as we move uh, forward. And I just wanted to uh, to actually get a bit more practical, even more practical than we're currently being, which is you know really around how men can be better allies. Um, and and um, we've all shared, you've all shared some of your thoughts there, um, but I, I'd really uh, like to, to start with the day-to-day -day aspects of that. Um, 
and whether that's around removing some of the microaggressions or you know whatever it might be what you would like to to highlight here about how men can be more effective on a day-to-day -day basis uh, Kathleen if you don't mind can, can we start with you on that yeah no I'd love to share my thoughts and before I do I'm just going to tell all of you let all you men in on a secret that um, may or may not be known to you um, but what I would ask you to think about all the time is the fact that women count and I'm not saying women count like women matter, because yes, women matter and men matter, we all matter, but women count as a verb. So every time there's a list, every time there's a list of promotions, there's a leadership team, there's a you know, board of directors, there's a special group that's being formed to work on a project, there's a speaker agenda for a conference. Every time a list comes out or an org chart or what have you, I guarantee you every woman will look at that list and they will look at the number of females, they'll count them and they'll calculate female representation on that list. So men just need to be aware of this because I, I think men who are truly passionate about being allies need to be allies all the time. So it's not just saying, yes, I'm sponsoring some women or I'm, I'm you know, doing a great job in developing the women on my team and giving them opportunities, but it's being allies in the moment that decisions are being made. Right. So really being, you know, fully aware of that when teams are being put together, when agendas are being drawn up, when, you know, speaker lists are being made, just keep keep in mind that what's going to happen is women are going to look at those lists or those agendas and they're always going to, you know, count and do that calculation. Um, so male allies, I would say need to, and we've talked about this already, need to speak up and, and call out if they if they have the opportunity to. You know, don't join panels that aren't diverse. Um, and if you don't speak up, and Mitesh, you talked about this, if you don't speak up, then you're endorsing whatever it is that's happening, whether it's a non-diverse team being formed or, or an all-male panel. Um, and I think if you're a, a portfolio manager in our industry, you have a really privileged position, right? Because you get to interact with management teams of companies that you're investing in or that you're lending to and just asking them what are your plans on you know improving or increasing the gender diversity within your organization in those management meetings sends a message sends uh you know shows that you it's something that you think about because you know we truly believe that more diverse teams will perform better so you know there's a as we as we already agree a business imperative there um, so I would say make it part of how you see the world and extend your allyship into, you know, all aspects of your role. And I think when men are doing that, they're being really excellent allies and they're using their platform and their voice to drive change. So it's not limited. Think about it very broadly in all the, all the ways that you interact in, in your work role. Thank you, Kathleen. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to turn to you. Um, what would you like to highlight for men to stop doing and indeed do more of to be more effective? Yeah, so I, I really agree with the points that, that Kathleen made there. Um, I think that the, the one thing I, I kind of, uh, a couple of things I'd like to add is first of all, kind of, as, as Mitesh mentioned, we need to kind of get away from this fear of, of getting it wrong. Um, or, and indeed kind of the fear of not doing something that's big enough. I think doing something small is a great place to start, it, you know, Kathleen had a brilliant example of, of the, um, the man who stepped in to kind of help her with, with the new role and the promotion. Um, but it doesn't have to always be that. I think it can be something small. Um, for me, the key one is, is listening and ties into Kathleen's point on empathy earlier. You know, listen when a woman is asking for help um, and be honest if your instinct is to maybe dismiss that request for help is weak. Um, Observe if, if the women in your team aren't thriving and ask questions, listen to those answers. And I think those conversations will, will really equip you with the information to be an active ally when decisions are being made. Um, and lastly, it's a bit of a cliche, but when a woman is, is speaking and is claiming space to speak, just, just listen. Um, I think these kind of small actions will you know, allow you to do the right things for the right people. And, and that kind of will have an extraordinary ripple effect, in, in my view. Thank you. Just listen. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Mark, you touched on earlier uh, around what I call the macro issues for the industry. Uh, senior leaders, you know, actually, dare I say, um, not just talking the talk, um, um, and um, you know, really driving the equality commitments to become true allies. Do you just want to share a few more thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, so you've only got to look at, at 
gender pay gap stats and compare them to gender pay gap reports. So the reports that come out alongside gender pay gap stats. Um, you know, the stats aren't moving and the reports make the world look wonderful. Um, there's a gap there between what people are saying and the real reality. Um, and I, you know, I think our, you know, our leaders, our industry leaders need to, to stand up. I would love somebody, L last year, I think there was only one leader within the financial services sector who in their um, gender pay gap report stood up and said, this isn't good enough and I'm stopping bonuses because of it. And that was the leader of the TSB, who was a woman. Um, I would love to see some more people within the investment and savings industry at the top, look at their gender pay gap stats and say, this isn't good enough. We're not, you know, it's, we're not moving in the right direction. It's a business imperative and we're going to start getting things right. And we start going, we're going to start not just talking the talk, we're going to walk the walk. Um, Thank you. I, I'm, I'm, we have a CEO sitting here um, next to you in, in my gallery. So I'm going to turn to Mitesh um, and um, not going to get you out to answer that specific question, but I, I do want you, you mentioned before that you, know, you want to encourage more men to be more effective allies to women. Um, in practice, what is that going to look like for you? And that uh, you know, other men can actually hear and maybe actually uh, incorporate into their own thinking and doing. Um, th thanks, John. So a few, few things that I've learned and have been doing for a while, and then a couple of things that I'm learning here on this panel and, and otherwise that, that I'd love to do better. Um, so uh, the, the, the idea of just really recognizing that we don't know and we're not right, and the only way to learn is by asking and listening and to keep asking. And, and I know that the women that I work with say to me, don't just ask once and then be done. Ask again, consistently ask. When you're about to speak about something, you know, ask, ask first and, and, and get that perspective. And uh, to add to what Sarai said earlier, don't just listen, but make notes. <laughs> and so <laughs> I've been making notes throughout this and I, I always make notes um, because that's all part of the process of really seriously wanting to learn or unlearn and relearn, as I often say. Um, the other one that I've learned a lot about is paying attention, paying attention to the room or the, the, the Zoom call who is uncomfortable, who isn't speaking, who isn't laughing, who isn't um, being called upon, and just creating space and calling it out. There are just little things that we could do to be better male allies in every meeting, in every interaction, every day. Uh, back to your points, Sarai, about this thing. It's the small things, but it's the compound effect of doing it all the time. The one that I've learned in recent times and, and here as well is, is, is really the idea of publicly acknowledging the mistakes that you've made and when you've been called out. And, and I do do it, I could do it more of it because I do think it makes it more normal and more natural and encourages other people to call out their senior leaders. Um, and the other one is putting a spotlight on the, on, on the male allies that are doing a good job and, and, and calling out what they're doing well uh, to others. Well, that, well, that's great. In fact, you've covered two of the questions from the audience that I now know no longer no need to, to put which I think is great. There is, there is one I do, do want to bring out. In fact, there's a couple here I, I just want to bring out. And if I may, Kathleen, I'm, I'm going to start with you because I know that Goldman's, like many, many organisations, you know, have, uh, have a, 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 a gender um, employee resource group. Um, uh, and um, your views on whether that should be um, for women only or whether there should be times uh, that men are involved in that and, and, and can the resource groups be used more effectively to, in, to raise the awareness of men, the learning piece, um, and get them more involved? Your, your, your views on that? Um, that's a good question. We've um, certainly done work to um, encourage and make sure that, and I don't know if you're referring to some of the affinity networks, John, in terms of some of the, um, what we have you know, to try and, and build more inclusive cultures. Um, you know, certainly if you have a, a women's affinity network or a women's network that, you know, is only for women or only involves women, then, you know, that's just an echo chamber and that does not get, you know, more, more male involvement. So we've, we've worked hard to try and, again, extend the conversation and make sure that there are men who are advisors to the women's, various women's networks that are sponsors to the women's networks that are, you know, um, involved and 
attending events or being, you know, uh, or speaking or what have you. So we've tried to make sure that there is inclusiveness even around something like uh, like a women's network that is, you know, really one of the affinity networks. And I think that extends as well. When there are events, we ask networks to join up and do them together. So I think that's another example of trying to broaden the conversation uh, and make sure more men are involved in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's great. And, and I'm going to put um, a here and now question, um, which I think is a really, really good question someone's asked, which is the fact that over the last 12 months or so, you know, of, of um, increased remote working, in fact, across the industry, pretty much only remote uh, working, there's been a, a significant increase in, by men, um, or everybody, but particularly men, of the understanding uh, of the need for flexibility, indeed, the admiration for how so many of their female colleagues are juggling their lives, which of course they've always had to juggle, uh, but even more so um, during, during this pandemic. Um, and is there, is, is, there's an opportunity here, question, is there a real opportunity or is the industry gonna go backwards to their old ways of, of, yeah, we did understand that, but now we're gonna forget about that because um, you know, we're all open again. Um, and you know, that focus on understanding our people uh, isn't gonna be so great. So what are we gonna be doing to make sure that doesn't happen and we take this uh, as an opportunity? Mitesh, you know I'm gonna ask you first. So uh, let's go to you. Just coming off mute. Um, I think if I, if I could just pick one thing, um, it would really be the idea of, um, uh, hard to choose. Uh, if I had to just pick one thing, it would really be the idea of uh, publicly sharing when you've been challenged um, and, and encouraging that challenge um, as a part and parcel off. I think it does multiple things. It acknowledges we make mistakes as, as leaders. It celebrates the fact that you're being called out, but it also then shares that learning with others. And I think, I know somebody said in the chat that we're talking a lot, but we're not making enough progress. I think I see that as a fundamental lever to, to accelerating that, that progress because it, it, it comes right down to the heart of the kind of ego and the need to be right. Thank you. Sarai, you, your views on this, I'm deliberately um, turning to you next, um, you, um, partly because um, you, know, you, you don't have children. Um, and so I suspect, and I'm making huge assumptions doing exactly what you told me not to do. So I'm calling myself out in advance. Um, but I expect you're actually seeing your colleagues as well, you know, who you know, even more so about some of these struggles that they have to deal with. And how do we really make sure we don't lose that and we have and we have that better understanding that goes through the rest of our lives, not just the next few months? Yeah, I am. Um, I yeah, it's a it's a good question, John, and I think um, something that we all have to to kind of consider continue. I think it's going to take continued work, continued conversations. Um, and I really liked Mitesh's suggestion actually about using, um, you know, all of us kind of understanding and getting a bit more comfortable with mistakes being called out and talking about when we get it wrong and learning from that and using that as an opportunity to to grow. And and I think we you know we've learned a huge amount about the way we work and the way we can work in um, over this year. And, and uh, I think it's going to take um, take some kind of work to, to continue to remember that, to keep headlining it. But keep calling ourselves out and reminding ourselves. Um, yeah. I think a nice one. I'm, I'm very, very conscious of the time. We're into our last five minutes. And I, and I, I want to give everyone an opportunity uh, to uh, ensure that you, know, you leave you know, your one key message, um, whether that's a practical tip or whether that's a really strong message you want to leave, uh, for for the audience, and that may well be, for example, your personal choose to uh, challenge commitment if that's where you want to go. Just to get it started, um, I'm going to um, take the liberty of the moderator to to share my own, um, and I'm personally truly committed to the diversity project's targets for the whole of the uh, investment saving industry of having 30% female fund managers and halving the gender pay gap by 2030, which are ambitious but are are required. I've no doubt that in order to do this, we need to see a sea change in both the numbers and effectiveness of male allies at all levels. To Sarai's point, it has to be at all levels, and in particular, senior leaders. And I'm going to personally do all I can to support and encourage more men to become actively involved in supporting gender equality, to encourage them to call me out and for me to call them out. Okay. 
Kathleen, let's turn to you. Your one takeaway. One takeaway. I think in, in sharing a lot of this stuff with you guys and on the panel today and with the audience, I realized that I probably haven't shared it um, so much with my male colleagues. And so I think for me, um, my takeaway is I'm going to you know, be more vocal in men that want to understand how to be better allies, and I'm happy to coach them on that. And um, I put that out there, and I will take that back to, uh, to work with me and, uh, and make sure people are aware that I'm happy to share my thoughts and my advice and my guidance on this. And I will be taking a lot of the learnings of what I heard from, uh, from the panelists today. I think there's some great, great, great practical tips that I'll take back and share and try to develop more male allies within our organization. That's great. Thank you, Kathleen. Mark, last time coming off mute, if you like, uh, your one takeaway. Uh, I've only made the mistake once, John. Come on, once, once in an hour is not bad. It's probably a record for me. Um, I, I, I talk to the men out there in the audience. Um, listen, don't ask what you can do. Um, ask why you're not doing it today. Um, you know, for over 100 years now, um, and probably well longer than that, Women have stood up for, fought for, and demanded social change that we as men have benefited from. You know, today we have more opportunity, more choice than we've ever had, but we're no longer constrained by male stereotypes of the past. Um, we increasingly work in meritocracies, in cultures that allow us to contribute and belong wherever we are in that structure. Um, we're able to make decisions about how we live, our relationships, um, even our gender, that our fathers may have only dreamed of. Um, so more so than ever, we can belong and we can contribute. We haven't got far to go. Let's, let's take those 20, 30 targets that, that John has just discussed and put forward. Um, let's accelerate towards those, but we need to do it hand in hand. We need to do it together. We all need to be inclusionists. Let's go and do it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Mitesh, over to you. Uh, thanks, John. Yeah, just, just to say that I think um, for me, I have focused a lot of my time and energy on sponsoring and being an ally to the women in, in the firm. And I think what's really dawned on me recently and specifically through these conversations has been the work I need to do with the men in the firm. And I've celebrated many of the great men who have been great allies and role models, but that's not enough. It needs to be every man, um, certainly every manager and team leader that we work with. So that's going to be on my list and my focus. Thank you, Mitesh. And the last word for you, Sarai. Thanks, John. Um, so I, my takeaway would be, remember, you can have a massive impact with starting with something small. Start next week, take a genuine interest in someone's career, have a coffee, listen for those opportunities and the feedback that they give you. Those conversations will naturally equip you um, for the next step to being a really impactful and effective ally. Well, thank you. Thank you all. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Thank you enormously to Kathleen, Mark, Sarai and Mitesh, and to all of the audience, thank you for your participation and your engagement. Um, just a reminder, the webinar has been recorded. In a week or so, um, we will be putting it out and also watch out for the social media uh, posts. Uh, thank you for everybody and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks John. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Cheers, guys.